Good evening. Welcome to our Center for Urban Engagement lecture tonight. My name is Noah Tolley. I am the director of the Center for Urban Engagement. Center for Urban Engagement includes a number of programs. It includes our urban studies major. It includes our urban studies minor. It includes reading groups and colloquia for our supporting faculty that come from every division of the college. Uh, we put on public lectures like we have tonight. We have our Wheaton and Chicago program as well. This is the, and our Equitas program for those students that are out there, yes. Um, this is the fourth of four Center for Urban Engagement lectures this year. Our first three lectures were by Kathy Eden, Noel Castellanos, and Natalie Moore. And if you uh, participated in any of those, if you're there in the audience, you'll know what a special event some of those were. Uh, next year's lineup includes Carlo Rotella, from Boston University, an award-winning American studies author who's recently written a book on the south side of Chicago. You won't want to miss that on September 25th. Jamie Calvin is the founder and executive director of the Invisible Institute. And he is a journalist who first broke the Laquan McDonald shooting story. He'll be with us in November. He also continued doing most of the best reporting on that story all the way through the end of the trial mostly with Slate. And we'll also have Junia Howell, a sociologist, and Kristen Fort knows Junia, uh, a sociologist and uh, Wheaton alum who is at University of Pittsburgh and has recently published quite a bit of work on the relationship between economic inequality and disaster recovery policy in urban areas of the United States. You won't want to miss those three lectures. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Michael Emerson. Uh, Dr. Emerson is provost at North Park University and author of a number of books and other studies, uh, one of which many of us know, that is Divided by Faith, one of which is coming soon, and he'll talk with us about that tonight in his talk, Urban Soul, Market Cities, People Cities, and Our Future. To put in perspective the influence of Dr. Emerson's work, and the ways in which he has personally touched the lives of people who are in our circle, I will tell you a story of something that has only happened once in all my years of introducing anyone or inviting someone to speak. When I sent out the notice to our supporting faculty that Dr. Emerson would be here tonight, I had multiple supporting faculty write back to me and ask if they could have the honor of introducing Dr. Emerson. Uh, in fact, I've never had that happen with any other speaker. I have to invite people to introduce someone, invite people to do the welcome. In this case, I got lucky because two others had classes tonight and couldn't make it. Um, and so it was easy for me to choose Dr. Brian Miller, um, who will introduce our speaker tonight and talk about some of uh, the speaker's impact and influence and also their personal connection. Not knowing that I had competition for this, I'm now extra delighted to introduce Michael Emerson, sociologist and provost at North Park University. Three things stand out to me about Michael. First, his strong record of scholarship. Noah mentioned just a few pieces there, but he's written 15 books, including Divided by Faith, People of the Dream, Multiracial Congregations in the United States, and another book, Transcending Racial Barriers, and 13 other books, or 12 other books, and over 60 articles total. His work is widely read and highly respected in the field of sociology, particularly in the areas of race and religion. He provides a great model for aspiring scholars. I hope we have some of them in the room here tonight. Faithful Christians can and should pursue high-quality social science research, and Michael's a great example of that. Second thing that came to mind, his commitment to working with other scholars. I've had a little taste of this myself in my career. Michael uh, and I overlapped for one year at Notre Dame, and then he was on my dissertation committee. And Michael is always encouraging. Even at dinner, he was saying, work sounds great, send it to me, I'd love to see it. I know that it's true of other people. We've had multiple speakers who have come here and acknowledged Michael's influence on their career. Uh, Michael looks for ways to champion the work of others. If scholars are measured on their graciousness and willingness to mentor others, and I would argue that doesn't happen enough, Michael would rate very highly on that scale. Third thing that came to mind is his participation in the community and in church. 
The choices Michael and his family have made over the years demonstrate strong Christian convictions as well as a dedication to the flourishing of all in their communities. And I think we'll see some of that come out tonight as he's speaking about two cities that he has some close affinities to. So with all that said, uh, it's my honor to hear, and with you as well, to hear from Dr. Emerson tonight. Let's welcome him to the front. Brian, I gotta say thank you. You know the standard line where I wish my mother was here to hear it, but she's not, so I appreciate it. Hey, I'd like a lot of visuals, so I got a lot of PowerPoint slides, but the good thing is a lot of it is pictures. And uh, I learned recently that I get to make that academic because we call that visual sociology. So it's not just pictures, it's, it's science. All right. So I'm going to start with a question I think a lot of times we don't think about too deeply. We see cities, they're there, we try to figure out how to survive in them, how to make them better perhaps, but we rarely stop and say, what is a city for? Why do humans keep moving to cities? Uh, for most of human history, until 1800 or so, never more than 3% of people lived in cities. It's amazing when you think about it. We're a very recent urban people in terms of lots of us, but now it's over half of us, and it doesn't look like there's any sense of it stopping uh, within just by the time 2050, when a lot of us will still be here, maybe not me, but a lot of you, uh, they say something like two-thirds of us, and by the end of the century, pretty much 85, maybe even 90% of all humanity will live in urban areas. So what's going on? What I wanna do is have us think about that a little bit. I'm gonna just borrow from Tim Keller's work and just, Biblically, in his understanding, he argues there's really three, among many reasons, but there's three reasons. And because I, I'm not borrowing from Noah Tolley because you know him and you've got to read his work, so I'm bringing in a little different work as well. That the city releases our greatest potential, that the way that God has designed us to be communal social beings with one another is unleashed in a city in this way. It, that we're called to create and we do it best together, and if enough of us are together, we call that a city, right? And the more that come together, the more it is a city. The second is that the city, and this is really its founding, the very first city, is a place of refuge, a place where there is, it was set up for somebody who had done a murder, and instead of immediate uh, sentence or lynching or whatever might happen, the city was the place where there should be a fair shake at a trial. So a city is a place of refuge. If you just broaden that, of course, it does become that. I often use this, it's a strange example, but if you like to dye your hair purple, nobody has purple hair here. I've done that example and there have been people with purple hair, but uh, oftentimes you'll feel, you can find other people with purple hair in a city. It's like a place for people that like to be different or misfits or that don't quite fit the mold of the larger society. The city is always kind of served as that. And then third, the city compels us to spiritual searching. It's very interesting. Um, sociologically, what we find is that cities are doing two things simultaneously. They are, as people are coming from different areas with kind of a, a homogenous set of understanding, say, of their faith, they come into cities and they start bumping into people with different faith or no faith, and it challenges them. Some people then want to give up their faith or they change their faith. But what happens is that in cities, this is because of that process, you find a deep, deep and eternal searching of people for spiritual meaning because they're constantly running into this difference. Ultimately, they're trying to figure out, is there any absolute truth? So the potential for Christianity to blossom and bloom is in cities. It's no coincidence that when Jesus comes, it's when we had our first true network of cities with the grand city of Rome and because it had conquered so much, it had actually created the early version of roads connecting all of these cities. And that's how the message of the gospel spread, city to city to city. Look in the New Testament. The books are named after cities because that's where they could bring the message and then disseminate it out. So cities are powerful places. So we want to understand how then should we build a city? If we're supposed to be in cities, if cities have these great potentials, if God in a way designed them for his message to spread, then is there any sense of what kind of city we should build? 
what I'm going to do today with you is to talk about two kinds of cities that I see emerging in the modern world. You will probably read into what I say to think I am saying one kind of city is better than another. But I won't say that, at, not at this point. I want you to think about it. What I'm going to try to do is say that there are two kinds, and maybe those two kinds aren't the kind we're supposed to build, or maybe one is and one isn't, or maybe they both have aspects we should work on. So let's look at that. I just had a book come out recently um, with uh, one of my uh, graduate students who's now a prof young professor. Yes, my middle name is Olaf. Um, I, I, I usually just go by Michael O, and now you know why. Okay. <laughs> so it's a very simple argument in this book. And the argument is this, that cities, because they can do infinite number of things, but we are finite, ultimately have to make decisions and choices about what they're going to stress, what they're going to value, what they're going to put their money to. Those choices aren't made like we all get together and easily make that decision together. It's a contest. There's battles. Sometimes they're political, sometimes they're on the streets. But ultimately, a culture gets established and a way of doing things comes to be, and if you want to change that, you have to go through all the contests and contestations and battles once again. So we say that cities create what we call a priorities rubric by which they make their decisions with their finite resources, and that what we're seeing in modern Western cities is that they really only make two choices. Either they say what matters first and foremost is the market, and so we have to make our decisions to benefit the market, or what matters first and foremost, welcome, is the citizens, the actual people living in our city, so we have to make our decisions around that. I'm going to show you the implications throughout this talk, profound implications by that simple upfront decision. Notice that I'm not saying that some cities care about the market and some care about their, the people in their city. They have to care about both. I'm saying which serves the other. Does the market serve people? Do people serve the market? Which is valued first? So let's look at it this way. If you were to press market city people, they would say, you know why a city exists? For this reason. We're trying to have a thriving economy. We're trying to produce jobs, lure companies, and ultimately to create wealth. And in so doing, we will have a thriving life. So if things like quality of life or health care will help us get to that end goal, then we'll care about those. I just saw in the Chicago Tribune last week, the Chicago Tribune, we have, what, 14 or 15 mayoral candidates, and I was surprised to see that they endorsed Bill Daley, who would be the third Daley, and uh, yeah. But it was interesting because they gave a complete and 100% market city argument. They didn't have to uh, explain why it mattered. All they had to do was say this, and it basically took it word for word, is what I have up here. Vote Bill Daley because Chicago needs a thriving economy, we need to keep creating jobs, and we need to increase our wealth. And Bill Daley is the man to do it. What's behind the scenes there, of course, is that they're making the assumption that we all say that's what matters, so therefore, he's the best person to do what we matter. So you can tell I'm going to be arguing that Chicago is itself a market city, we'll get to that. The reasoning, just I'm gonna give you two examples so you can see how it might differ. So, the end goal is a strong economy. You might care about having a quality health care system because it will give you healthy workers who will help make you more competitive, luring business, more profitable, more wealth created. Contrast that with people cities. The goal is, and look at how different this is, a high quality of life for all people, to be a place that's friendly to people's needs, that's lively, healthy, sustainable. All right, so insofar as like, having lots of jobs gets us to that end goal, then we'll care about those issues. So the end goal and the starting point, they go in a circle, right? High quality of life for all. In that sense, then you have to have universal high quality health care, so we see a first difference. That can lead to several jobs because it's for everybody, increasing our tax base, which we'll use to increase the quality of life for people. Um, so what I'm saying is that cities are diverging into two directions. And any of you that know who this group is, this is one direction going in two directions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the end of the jokes for tonight. <laughs> Some of you are saying that was a joke. Uh. All right, 
this slide's got too much on it, but I just, I just want to make one point. All of these things that we see as separate issues, crime, the environment, segregation, poverty, all of it, they're interrelated. They go together. And we're saying, and, and we're finding this in our studies, that people cities tend to, across all of these things, have this manifestation. Market cities have this. I'll give you one example, crime. If you're in a market city, you can give your entirety of your life to reducing crime, and my argument will be that no matter how successful you are, you will never get crime lower than a people city has. That the very nature of the kind of city you're in means you're in a certain range of crime. If you're in a people city, you're in a lower range of crime. And you could spend your life trying to make crime go up in a people city, but it would never get as high as a market city's lowest point. Okay, so these are very different kinds of places for some specific reasons. So let me just summarize, this is, this is sociology speak, so I won't go into too much, but cities have these, what we call culturally imbued. They're culturally arrived at. They're not, not fixed in anything. They can be changed, but ultimately through negotiations, they come to this. All right, so I'm gonna first classify some cities and get a sense of where cities fall in the world. How do we do our classification of market or people cities? We looked at city documents. Surprisingly, most every city says what they are, not in that word, but they list their priorities and it becomes very clear. If they say, number one, we care about the economy, that's a pretty good sign they're a market city. We looked at how they spend their money, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment. We looked at some of the main documents across these cities, the statements that leaders make, the arguments that are made, including like when papers endorse candidates, what arguments do they present? So that last one becomes very important. If you live in a market city and you want to argue for more parks, you have to put it into an economic context. You have to say, if we produce more parks, it will lead to greater wealth in our city because it will attract high-end workers, the creative class who will want to be here, and they will jumpstart our economy. Um, when you're making the argument from a people city perspective, you, you, you actually have to, let's say you want more jobs in a people city. You have to show how that's going to lead to a greater quality of life for people. If you start saying it will lead to more wealth, people will turn you off right away. So it's a different frame that people are looking and using. I'm going to use a five-point scale. So it's not just an either or, but it's a, on a continuum. So a strong market city, lean market, kind of right in the middle. Those are interesting places we have to know more about. Lean people, strong people. All right, so what are some strong market cities? Houston, Shanghai, Dubai, Torino, Bucharest. These are places that wholly, wholeheartedly see themselves as there to make vibrant economies and have lots of jobs and luring companies. Lean market, you'll see among this list that Chicago is in, we've placed them in that category. Some that are right in the middle, um, Berlin probably being the biggest city we could find that seems to be somehow a balance between these. One question we have is we don't know if they are just, these cities are transitioning from one side to the other or if they will stay there. Lean people, you see some of these, and then strong people cities, Copenhagen, Zurich, Munich, Stockholm, Tokyo. Tokyo is interesting, second biggest city in the world, biggest metro in the world, depending on how you measure it. They are on that side. What I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is compare these four cities so we can really get a sense of how it matters which category you're in. So let me explain why I'm using these four cities. In the book, we uh, take what we call the ultimate uh, endpoints within the continuum of cities. The strongest market city we could find was Houston, Texas, USA, and the strongest people city, Copenhagen, Denmark. In case you're not sure where Denmark is, it's not the Netherlands where Amsterdam is. Uh, Denmark is a Scandinavian country right across the bay from Sweden. All right, so Portland um, is the strongest people city in the United States. We have no truly strong people city in the United States. We have lean people, a few of them. So we, have, we go to Portland, Chicago, because it's one of our major cities and it's a clear example of a lean market city. I have to pull in Copenhagen, as I mentioned, because we don't have any strong people cities in the US. Perhaps when we are having discussion, we could talk about why that is. All right, so just to remind you, we're gonna look at two market cities, one strong, one leaning that way, 
two people cities, one strong, one leaning that way. All right, so just a couple slides that aren't pictures, and then we get to the fun part, the pictures. All right, so we went and looked on the website. What do these cities say they care about? What are their priorities? You can see here for Houston, it says economic development is first and foremost, followed by jobs. Then they argue that to have economic development and the jobs, we're gonna to have to create a safe area or else jobs won't wanna be here, businesses won't come. So they make safety their third. And infrastructure, we'll see they put quite a bit of money to that. They say because we have to have an easy flow of goods and services. So as we're attracting all these jobs and businesses, we need a strong infrastructure to move all that stuff around. Chicago is pretty much the same, but it has a couple more. So economic development, job safety, and then adds universal pre-K, pre-kindergarten and cultural development of some sort. Those are kind of mark or people city types. So that's where they become leaning, not full on strong. Look at the difference with Portland then. These are just completely different ways until you get to the bottom. So we care about livability and high quality of life, accessible, equitable transportation, environmental resiliency, not just policing, they call it community policing, which has to be in cooperation with the neighborhoods. And then they do have a clear indicator of economics mattering. Okay, and then Copenhagen, all citizens quality of life is what we care about first. Second, that will be a city of social equality, which they define as all their citizens and all their neighborhoods. We will be knowledge-based because that's the way that the world is. So we're gonna have a highly educated population. Copenhagen leads the world in re-educating its people and updating their, their uh, knowledge. And then we're gonna be the first carbon neutral city in the world. Um, they began that in 2015 and their target is 2025 and they're measured by an outside firm. The outside firm says they're halfway there so they look like they're on track. And transportation wise, and they specify what that means, no more than a third of all trips that come through the city, whether it's people from the suburbs, will be in a car. They want people on bikes, walking, and public transportation. They want that because they identify that to make healthier and happier citizens from their studies. You can say whatever you want, where do you spend your money? Houston takes their budget and spends 17% for enterprise funds, that's specifically to recruit companies. 29% to keep the city safe, and then 42% on infrastructure. We went through also and categorized how much money is specifically targeted for the citizens themselves directly or for their neighborhoods they live in. So for Houston, 2%. Chicago, they have an interesting budget model where half their money goes to try to cover their pensions and such. <laughs> So they have a big budget, but then after that is safety and infrastructure to others, and about 10%, so a fair bit more than Houston, goes to people and neighborhoods directly. Some of that is because of their universal uh, pre-K that they want covered and because of that cultural development we looked at. Portland is of another order, being a people city. A third goes to how they define high quality of life, 12% to equitable transportation, 8% to the environment, 25% to community policing, and then you can see 60% directly to the people or neighborhoods. Copenhagen, very different, right? 60% to social services. Right down to every uh, classroom has a social worker in it to make sure nobody's being left out of the group. And the city pays for that. Education and culture, 13%. What they call the common experience was just to produce uh, lively events in the city where people will come together, 11%. They're in a national healthcare system, but the city itself then adds an additional 6% of its budget to give even better healthcare. All told, um, people in neighborhoods, about 90% goes directly to their citizens and the neighborhoods they live in. All right, so you might be thinking, how do you compare the budget? Like how much tax you gotta pay? Well, there's a pretty clear relationship here. In fact, if you wanna move from one level to the next kind of city, multiply by 1.5, and that's what we tend to find. So that if you take Houston's, this is budget per person, and as you can see, includes the public school budget, because some of them do, some don't, so I had to put them together. Houston allocates about $2,800 per citizen, per resident. Multiply that by 1.5, and you end up basically where Chicago is. Multiply that by 1.5, then you're at Portland, by 1.5 again, and 
you get Copenhagen. All right, so of course, if they were pocketing all this money, this would be problematic. Uh, so you have to follow where they're feeding all this money, but it tends to be that the people cities have higher taxes and then direct it way more, much more directly back into the people in the city and their neighborhoods. All right, now the pictures. Okay, let's start with streets. Now, I think for pictures, uh, and just to, to warn you here, it's easiest for me to show you city design with my pictures. Uh, so I'm gonna do a lot of that here, not because that's the only thing that matters, but it's easy to illustrate. How do you design streets in a full-on market city? Uh, you, again, remember, they're gonna move people and goods, and they're gonna do it with a car, so that you design streets like this. They're quite wide, but as you can see, there's very little room given for people to walk. There's no room given for people to be on bikes. The entire assumption is, of course, that you'll be on, in cars. There's a problem with relying on car transportation in that it's uh, harder for poor folks to have a car that works than a wealthy folk, right? So you're asking more and more of poor folks if this is the kind of transportation you rely on. So Chicago has beautiful streets, but they have this same issue, right? So here we are downtown on a famous street. Almost all of the street is given for cars. There's some nice walkways, better than Houston's, but still, there's a long ways to go across, and if you're not, uh, I mean, if you're much older than me, it can be a struggle, or if you're sprained your foot, you're not gonna make it across before the light turns and people run you over. This is Portland and a lot of their streets. I went there in December to take some pictures. Wasn't a sunny day, but it can illustrate they got places for bikes, they got cars, they got quite wide space for walking. They also have more of these things than any other city in the country. Uh, what do you call those? Uh, food trucks, yeah. There's about six or 700 downtown. They're everywhere. Other streets in Portland don't have cars at all. They're for the trains. Uh, and you can again see how much space is given to people to be able to walk, the assumption that they could walk or ride bikes. So a different sense of what a city's supposed to be in the streets. But even Portland is not quite what Copenhagen is. So Copenhagen, in most of its core, is simply not only doesn't allow cars, but they don't even allow bikes, which is how most people get around. So you can see all the bikes there because on these walking streets, you have to get off the bike and you do your walking. If you can't walk well, then these are provided for you. They tool you around. Bike lanes, again, not because everybody wants to ride a bike, but study after study says, we are much healthier when we do things like ride bikes as opposed to riding in cars. Places like people cities take those studies and say, then we need to design cities to, to have healthy people. That means we should design cities that are less reliant on cars. Um, okay, so in, <laughs> in market cities, you do this. So this is uh, Chicago, but you could see this in Houston, wherever. Um, you make some attempt to provide for people to bike. If you do, lots of streets don't. But you can see the problem here, right? Moving cars become stopped cars and stopped cars become moving cars, so the, the lane in between is a death trap. It's just a matter of time before a government uh, official runs you over. So that's not the best design. It, it, it reflects priorities and it reflects, you know, not a whole lot of attention given to the thought that people would actually be biking. When I went to Portland, Portland is a bit better. Now, this is really the same design I just showed you, but they've, of course, emphasized that a bike lane is a separate thing by making it bright green, yes? But as you can see, still lacking because parked cars and moving cars have to cross that. So other streets, again, this where you, I mean, that's the solution, right? Just switch these two. That's all you have to do, which is what they've done here. And then it's a safe and protected zone for people to ride bikes. This is good, it's not Copenhagen good. Copenhagen takes it to a whole nother level, tr literally. So they use a wedding cake design. You have one level for walking, one level for biking, and one level for moving cars. And that's the design that's required. It's also required that the width of the bike lane must be for three people. So people can talk when they're riding. Bridges, so in Houston there's zero thought that anybody would walk. So there's, no, there's not even a sidewalk on these bridges, and this is one of about 10 bridges, all of which are bridges over what? They're bridges over the freeway. 
So, okay, here's Chicago. Again, look at the amount of space given to cars versus how much is given to people. So we kind of herd the people in these narrow pathways while the cars are having all kinds of room. Again, it reflects priorities. This is a bridge in um, Copenhagen, I'm sorry, in Portland. Uh, there's no cars, it's the middle lanes are for their uh, light rail, and then the outside is for walking and for biking. And then a lot of the bridges in, uh, this is an older bridge in Copenhagen. It's a bridge people love to hang out on, and you can see them sitting there. Whenever the sun comes out, they come and sit there like that. Just a couple more angles so you can get a sense of the size of it. The uh, bike lanes are wider than the lanes for vehicles. And you often see scenes like this. They also now are building bridges that are use specific. This one is a walking bridge, so you can see people with bikes, but they have to get off and they walk their bike. Well, what if you want to ride your bike? Now they've built bridges that are just for bikes. Trains. So Chicago has one of the best train systems in the US, but it is built for the market. Now look at this train system. Every train line goes to one place, to the market, the very center of the market. So if you want to go, say you're on the blue line there and you want to come visit somebody here, you can't just go like that on the train, right? They make you come to the market, switch train lines, come out here, it takes a long time. That's a specific design because the idea is if you feed everything into the market, that will grow the economy. That's part of the design for it. And in fact, it works. Downtown Chicago and then just outside of it where UIC and the medical complexes are, is about 800,000 jobs, second in the nation, easily, behind Manhattan. So that's one way to design, that's designing for a market. Portland, which has a newer system, is attempting to design more for people and the thought that they're not just trying to get downtown, but they have other places to go and might want to visit one another in their neighborhoods. This isn't ideal, but you can see that there are more places to connect that aren't downtown. Right? Every line may somehow eventually work its way through downtown, but you can get off and connect to different places. And then probably the ultimate here is in Copenhagen. Where you see these lines go out, those are actually suburban stops. So where you see all this morass of trains, that's the city. And they just finished here, this circle line here, and they did that because there was a, a rule passed in the city that every citizen had to live within a 15 minute walk of a train stop. And their solution was by putting in this circle line, that's, they, they then met that requirement. Okay, so there's all kinds of places to connect. Every line is going everywhere. There's that circle line connecting, there's that yellow line connecting, and so on. Here, for scale, think of the city of Houston. Here is their train system. Downtown, the football stadium, and two universities that are right by downtown. That's it. Residential, here's my street in Chicago. Tell I took it this winter. Not the polar vortex day though. But so many residential streets in Chicago look like this, right? There's enough room for three cars, so we give two to parking and make one-way streets. And the, because there's so many cars, they can't, uh, they just do this, and then you're stuck trying to figure out how to get out, all right? I know when I used to live in Minneapolis, didn't have as many cars, you could make you park on one side and the plow would come through and clear, and the next day you park on the other side and they come through and clear. They don't do that in Chicago. All right, so here's Copenhagen. In a way, it's exactly the same. There's just enough room for a car to go in the middle and they park on the side, but here's the difference. In the middle third of every street, no cars go at all, and instead the city comes to the residents of each street and says, what would you like here? And they get a budget. This particular street, they chose to have some places to eat. They've got a covered sandbox. They got some planters. Other streets I would see swing sets. Depends on if there's kids on the street or not. Okay, so it's a different sense. Again, it's always trying to create space for their citizens to interact. I'm gonna show you two kinds of uh, housing designed for students. So this is some housing in Chicago that's supposed to be priced so that college students in the city can afford it. It's nice looking, right? What I wanna compare is like, if you look at the outside, there's not a lot of attention to given it. It's the thought that the main thing is to get inside and be in your place. 
This is probably where you throw your trash or something. I don't know. Okay, so here's some student housing in Copenhagen. You can see how much space is given on the outside. You even get water. There's places to sit. What you can't see is that this is built tiered so people can just sit there like they are. What I really want to show you, though, is what, what they've done with the inside of the building. So the inside is designed, again, that there's going to be interaction, but even that they're thinking about interaction between the people on the outside and on the inside. And that's why they have all of these things with all the glass jutting out. You can see, if you look, some people looking. It's built to be at a height where people can still talk to each other. Everything is this conscious decision. How do we get people to interact more? What do we do? How do we design it? The thing about market cities is that they are places of contrast. So you will find the greatest of and the worst of. I'll just give you, okay, so this is Houston. What this is is the largest, widest road in the world. It's 24 lanes wide, goes from downtown, uh, about 30 miles out into the suburbs. And you can see all, every lane is used. Um, and it, their, their solution is we will rely on cars and we'll just keep adding lanes. And so we're at the 24, and there's a proposal to make it 30, so we'll see if they do it. We could do this for Chicago. Um, maybe some of you have seen that. You can map distributions of income, and they tend to be clustered. So where you see reds and pinks, that's the poorest neighborhoods. And in Houston, it's a reverse crescent moon. If I were to overlay uh, race and ethnicity, you would see it's a reverse crescent moon. I want to focus on just one neighborhood called Fifth Ward. So Fifth Ward was a neighborhood established in 1866 when slaves were freed. They weren't allowed to just go wherever. If they were in Houston, they had to go to this neighborhood. This was called the Freedmen's Neighborhood, and it was for former enslaved African Americans. I, there's a um, redevelopment company there. We have Christian Community Development Association. I was the board chair of this one. So I spent a lot of time there looking and studying and using some of my, I was at Rice University then, some of my fellow colleagues to help me study some things. So one of the things is before segregation was ended and before freeways came through and cut the neighborhood into four, it was a very vibrant place. And this is the same street corner in the 1950s. You can see there's a lot going on, people walking around, there's businesses. Here's the exact same street corner today. It's just gone, it's complete disinvestment. Um, and you can see, if you look, there, the downtown is, is pretty close. You can see it there, you can walk there from there. Yet there's nothing there, whereas you go on the other side of the downtown, million dollar things going up everywhere, they can't build fast enough, cranes everywhere like you see in downtown Chicago. If you look at where there are homes in this neighborhood, this is what they look like. You get basically what to me, before I was here, would have thought this is rural southern poverty, but this is city southern poverty. Lots of homes look like this. In fact, I had a student once do an entire paper on homes in Fifth Ward where trees are growing out of. Okay, so about 50% are just vacant now. The homes are rapidly deteriorating for the people that are there. What our organization did was attempt to build new homes using different government programs and such. So we could build about 50 new homes a year. We have an architect that was a specialist in deterioration rates. We had him come and he and his students studied the neighborhood. And we said, if we build 50 a year at that rate, will we ever get where we can renew the entire area? And what he said was, at 50, years, at 50 a year, you lose ground every year. So he said, in 25 years, all homes will have been basically be on the ground, including the ones you're building. So we would have to build faster and build with better product to make it happen. Again, city of contrast. So Chicago has one of the most beautiful, incredible, amazing parks that you could ever want Millennium Park there. And at the same time, you can go, and even in, this is close by where I live, it's, it's a park too, but you can see it's a lot less care, right? There used to be three duckies, now there's one. Um, there's no concern with landscaping, as you can see. Yeah, so that's part of a market city. You have inequality, some amazing, some not. Copenhagen, uh, it's not allowed to have some amazing and some not. Uh, people that get elected would lose their jobs if they did, because part of that, again, their being a people city oriented is that the neighborhoods have to be equal as well. So what I'm showing you here, this is a neighborhood where lots of immigrants 
come to either, they either live there or they come to visit. And so they came and asked, um, they did a series of designs. It's about two miles long of this kind of urban vertical park and asked them about, about the colors and what kind of things they wanted. This particular set of groups wanted it to look like that. And it has swings. You can see that it has the bike lanes and everything like that. The next section looks like this. There are a lot of Muslims in the area, hence that fountain shape. Lots of places to play checkers and chess, as you can see, what the citizens had wanted. And then, of course, you have parks like this. They have former castles just right in the city, so you can be there. They put lakes in. Their water's become so clean that uh, the people said we'd like to swim in it, so the city built this water park here. They even do things like this because they also have this rule that everybody has to live within 15 minutes walk or boat ride from a park. So the solution here is to put these pocket parks in the water. <laughs> kind of fun. Now, the other thing when you see walking through Copenhagen is strange structures like this. Look at that thing. That would attract any child's eye and the horror of any parent. If you've been a parent, you see those kids up there. So in the US, I believe you would not be allowed to build this. I think you would be sued because people could get hurt. Now, why would they allow this in a place that says they care about people and health and all that? Because what they found is this does a couple of things that get them to their end goal. One is they are attracting children's attention and the children want to play here. So they're happy to do it. But the second effect, and this is where they really, why they design like this, is it requires that the parents or guardians interact with their children for their safety. As you can see, so they're working together and they're increasing time that families spend together. Okay, so, and, and in this particular structure, they found that families will spend about 15 extra minutes interacting as families in the city because that exists. There's another place where you walk by, and I remember walking by this one, suddenly you can just jump on trampolines. And as old and uh, maybe overweight as I am, I joined these children and was jumping with them, and we're laughing, and I'm, they're falling, and I'm falling, and it's just fun. It's, again, it's no reason, but it allows people to interact, families to have time together. I would meet, I can't even speak, I don't speak Danish very well. At that age, they don't yet speak English. So we couldn't interact with verb, verbal, but you have fun together anyway. Now, Copenhagen wasn't always this way. You'll see this quote at the bottom. We have decided that Copenhagen shall be the best city for people in the world. This is made by um, a man named Jan Gell, who's probably the most famous urban planner, urban architect in the world. He's a Copenhagen resident. In the 1960s and 1950s, he and his students, he was a professor at the Royal uh, Royal Academy of Architecture, Copenhagen, something like that. This is what downtown looked like. Every beautiful square, they have 16 squares, were parking lots, and every street looked like this. And he and his students came to this idea that they shall make Copenhagen the best place for people in the world. And the first idea they came up with, interesting enough, I suppose as urban planners, it makes sense, is what if we could convince the city to close this street here for a week to cars? and just see what happens. So they proposed it to the city. They wrote a letter to the city. The city wrote back and said that would be impossible because the business owners would lose business and they can't have that happen. So they did some more studies and tried to cite some things and say that we believe you'd actually increase business for the folks on there because we think that more people could walk. And they did an experiment. There's a great photo where they have the uh, students standing there's one person in every car, right? So they just have them standing there and you see all the open space. And then they did another picture where they filled it in with people. And it looks something like this, which is the very first week they were given permission to give it a try. And not only were there more people, there was, it went from 40,000 people a day going on the street to 250,000. Because there was so much more room and people found it so interesting. They also found that when they're walking, they're much more likely to notice shops and go into them. So it was a kind of a win-win by being people-focused. They actually increased the market outcome for those folks. So they tried it for a week, and the uh, business owners actually insisted that they try it for another week, and then a month, and then it became permanent. So this was the first street to be shut down. Here's another example. Now we're in the 60s. We got color. Notice the buildings in the back, because I'm going to show you the same street today. Those same buildings are all there. 
you see that the street in itself is it's been leveled off so it's all one big long walking street and the people fill it up they interact a lot of times you have street entertainers there people gather around again always feeding this focus of creating space where people will interact with people Copenhagen would say that there's one thing that makes people happy and by the way you all know the happiest city in the world is always in the rankings Copenhagen and the happiest nation Denmark always number one because they actually make a science of creating happiness it seems odd but they the number one predictor of happiness is how much time do I spend with other humans so that's what they're operating out of now why would this Jan Gell do it I interviewed Jan Gell uh, in 2013 he's not a Christian man and out of the blue when I asked him what got you into this this is what he said a Christian man I thought that was so weird that he brought that up came to me and said he wanted us to build housing for people he was very persistent you build housing for people not for other architects or profit or honor or your glory but for people he was asking that we not simply build flats or single-family homes but that we design housing that meets the needs of people especially their need to interact with others it's amazing to me because there's no other time he ever mentioned anything about faith or religion and I don't think himself to be a practicing Christian in any way but what stood out to him was this person that kept getting in his ear was a Christian person we don't know who this person was but I do wonder if they had a biblical understanding of what cities are supposed to be about or maybe could be about and that's why they came to him don't know exactly I want to give you just four comparisons now these aren't pictures but slides uh, some data won't get too complicated just to look so one of the things you would expect if you um, are a market city is that you, I would expect they'd have lower unemployment rates than people cities because after, after all market cities are focusing on that so we looked at these four cities and it was weird because it doesn't seem to be correlated in fact the highest right now is Houston when I went to Houston leaders and showed them this because they're in the um, a total market city uh, viewpoint they had an easy answer for that and that is because we are so successful at creating jobs we attract so many people when we grow so fast that we always are going to have some unemployment in fact our unemployment is a sign that we are a healthy market economy that's what they said um, you can see the lowest in this case is Portland and then there's, there's really no pattern here where there is a pattern is in how whatever wealth is in the city is distributed so there's this neat measure that we don't have to know how it's done but just how to interpret it called the Gini coefficient it is able to in one number capture the distribution of the wealth in the city so to help you interpret it when I show you a zero means that every single person has exactly the same amount of money in the city never we never come close to that right a one which is the highest value you can get means that one person has all the money and nobody else has any we never get close to that so it's more about what happens in the middle here okay so Houston and Chicago are very close. Both Houston and Chicago are on the side of the 0.5 that says the money is closer to be distributing, being distributed into one person's hand than into everybody's. And then you can see for these people cities, they're below that line, Portland and then Copenhagen even more so. Um, this one, uh, this is complicated. Um, the higher the number, <laughs> the more segregation between these groups. I'm gonna look at segregation between whites and everyone else, and then segregation between every group all combined. And by the way, this is a, a brand new set of measures developed and invented by Junia Howell, who will come here next year. She's a math, um, unbelievable. She looked at the way we used to measure uh, segregation and said it's wrong, and she was right, and so she produced a better way to measure it, yeah. So you can think of this as, as it says, the proportion of whites, we'll just focus on the first one there, proportion of whites that would need to move for whites to be equally distributed throughout the city. The highest it could be is half, because some get to stay. So 0.5 would be absolute everybody, in a sense everybody would have to move, if that makes any sense. So in Houston, it's very close to that. Whites are very segregated or separated from all the other populations. Houston, I mean, Chicago is quite high, as you can see, very close to Houston. And then Portland is of a whole different order. I can't do Copenhagen because they don't use racial categories like we do, so I don't have the data to compare. 
The other is, how about all the different groups? How segregated are they from each other? Here, where Chicago is actually higher, and the, the reason is in Houston, you will find black slash Hispanic neighborhoods, whereas in Chicago, those neighborhoods are separate too. And again, Portland is of a whole different order than the market cities. Uh, you're much more likely to get murdered in a market city. So in Chicago, which is astronomical, 24 out of every 100,000 people each year will lose their life. In Houston, 12 out of 100,000. How about in the people cities? 2.3 in Portland and then less than one in Copenhagen. So think about it, you're 25 times more likely to die by being murdered if you live in Chicago versus Copenhagen, at least. Now again, the hallmark of a market city is that isn't equally distributed throughout the city. So this is showing you where you are most likely to be murdered and not, no surprise, right? The south side and the west side. If you go to the far north side, zero to five, you almost ap approaching there the, the rates you would see in Portland, right? Here's comparing the neighborhoods in Copenhagen. They're all the same, less than one out of 100,000. This matters for something called trust. So the basis of social life as human beings, the only way we can interact with each other is we have to trust each other. If I say my name is Michael, you have gotta trust that that really is my name. If you don't, we got a lot of extra work we're gonna to have to engage in and it becomes very ineffective to move forward in any way. So we did a simultaneous survey for two years in Houston and in Denmark. In Houston, in English and Spanish, in Denmark, in Danish. Same questions, ask them this question. Do you think that most people can be trusted or can you never be too sure about others? And you'll see the gap in Houston most everybody walks around their day assuming somebody's trying to take something from them. They can't be trusted, so you have to be on your guard. Whereas in Copenhagen, as you see, 84% say most people can be trusted. It makes social life way more possible. It also makes doing things for the good of the city way more possible because people believe the best in others and believe they can be trusted as opposed to they're really trying to get more than me. But what I'm trying to say also is that's exactly what we would expect in a market city, right? Market city is built on the sense that we will compete and some will get and some will not. Trust matters and we were looking at um, about, what does it say, 79 different cities in Europe, 500 citizens per city, strongly correlated with these, uh, this whole sense of things. So if you trust, you feel much safer in your neighborhood, you feel much safer in your city, you feel much more satisfied with life, you feel much more satisfied that you live in a great place and so on and so forth. So trust does matter. All right, my last two slides for you. What I'm trying to say is just the simple concept of market city or people city, we're finding is associated with everything. It fundamentally shapes your life as a human being in these ways at a minimum how the city that you live in will be designed, how you will move through that city, how you're going to experience the city, how you're gonna live, the quality of the water, who your neighbors will be, the quality of the air, opportunity and success that's available to you, how trusting you'll be of other people, right on down to, and we find very strong correlations, in market cities people have much higher levels of stress and mental issues than in people cities. So here is my punch line. <laughs> Too obvious. <laughs> Ultimately, we have to know what kind of city that we are in if we're going to do any kind of work for change or for betterment. If we don't have an understanding of what kind of city on that continuum we're in, we have a high chance of being very ineffective. We're going to address all of these issues. So ultimately what I'm saying is you have to step back. And in terms of social change, if you want to be able to reduce segregation, lower homelessness, reduce crime, your best bet, I'm arguing, is not to do that, but instead to change the kind of city you're in. Because when you change the kind of city, all of those things go with it. And they happen almost by themselves. So that's my presentation. Let's have a discussion. I will end with this. Of course, Jeremiah 29.7. We are called to seek the peace and prosperity of the city. 
and to pray the Lord for it and to work for its good. All right. Questions? Thoughts? Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Yeah. I have a microphone that I will distribute to those who have their hands up and would like to ask a question. But first, let's give a hand to Dr. Emerson. Okay. Thank you so much, that was outstanding. Um, I was gonna ask, you talked a lot about connectivity, human connection, and I think about how we really value technology. I don't know if your research went into that, but how much uh, do you think technology plays into market cities versus people cities? I, I think that in both types of cities, they use technology, they just use them in very different ways for different purposes. So a lot of discussion that I see in the people cities is how to use connectivity, to increase connectivity between people, just to interact, to, to, to meet up at certain places, to attend some event. Market cities I see it used for how do you increase productivity of, the, of workers, how do you get them more efficiently through the city so they can get to work or school. So I, I see a difference there. Hi. Hi. So obviously in the world we have both people cities and market cities. Um, would anything bad happen if we only had market cities or if we only had people cities? Yeah, good question. So here's a downside of people cities. And it's a severe one and I don't think any, I don't know of a people city yet that solved it. Why don't we have a strong people city in the US? I would argue because we have racial diversity. And racial diversity makes having a people city nearly impossible and here's why. I saw this when I was in Copenhagen as they're getting more and more immigrants they, the way that uh, a place like Copenhagen works is that you have to have certain agreed upon principles that everybody believes in. One of them is they have this, that they have to have absolute belief in the equality between male and female. And if you don't, it doesn't work. And they require it. So if you want to become a citizen there, you have to ascribe to that. Well, as several immigrant groups are coming for whatever reason, that's not their belief. And there's a struggle to be able to integrate them into society as manifest by you can't become a citizen then. People City's downfall so far is that they struggle being diverse. If again, if you wanna have purple hair and do whatever you want and find other people with purple hair and hang out and form clubs with purple hair, it's probably better and easier in market cities because market cities don't have to care about how you turn out and they don't have to care about where you live. Market cities are happy to have you there, and if you can contribute to the economy in some way, great. That's all that, that matters. In people cities, they need you to be, uh, everybody has to be educated. They gotta make sure you get an education. They gotta make sure that we can agree and trust one another. They have to agree that we can have a certain basic level of income. So you have to care a lot about everybody and where they are, and it gets infinitely more difficult the more diverse you get. So that is one of its main downfalls. Uh, thanks, Mike, for this presentation. Um, two, two questions. Uh, the first is that I noticed there aren't any cities in your spectrum that would be from the developing world. And I wonder if there's a sort of certain level of kind of economic or political infrastructure that has to exist to even fit into your category of types of cities. And then in thinking about this transitioning from one kind of city to the other, specifically market to people, what do you think is the real driver of that? Is that, is that a political thing? Is it an, it, yeah, or is it a cultural thing? Or what do you think it is? Okay, so your first question is a good one. That's why we say that what we're saying is in the modern Western world, this is what we're seeing. And I do think exactly what you're suggesting, that it takes a certain level of economic success to be able to be in one of these categories. Otherwise, before that, you're pretty much just fighting for survival. I made a presentation similar to this in Shanghai and of course, if you remember, Shanghai was on the strong market city side. And after I finished, the professors that were in attendance, one of them raised his hand and said, of course we have to be strong market. All of our cities in China are because we're just trying to get ourselves established and have some level of wealth before we can start thinking about how to distribute it. Uh, which is interesting in a communist country, right? But that, that was his perspective. So 
that's the, that, I, I think I side with that, that there has to be a certain level of development before you can think about where you are on this range and start doing something about it. Um, my grad students disagree with me and they claim they found cities that, though poor and in the uh, developing world, that they are, they are, have been and always have been people cities. So I told them I need more evidence, so they're working on that. Yeah, does that answer the questions you asked? Oh, yes. So um, the drivers happen to be this. Um, and in most of the cities we looked at, it was a pretty common tale of, there, so that you might know of the book, I'm going to forget the author. I don't know how to say his name. He's a French author. Um, right to the City was the book. And that argued that, that citizens themselves have the right to create the cities as they want. They are the residents. They're not just there to serve whatever jobs happen to be there. And that took hold, um, places like Copenhagen, et cetera, and it was the working class largely that started pushing for these uh, changes, started asking for wholesale changes in what the city was about. At the same time that you had some of these elites like Ian Gell making changes, and those things, when they coalesce, when you have it at both levels, that's when it happens. Now, there seemed to be one thing that makes those coalesce, and that is a point of crisis. So Copenhagen's crisis was twofold. One was the oil crisis in the 1970s, and two was they were on the verge of bankruptcy in 1989. And that was the point at which they said, we're going to completely switch the kind of city we are. And we saw that as a common theme across those. Hi, so I was wondering, I have a, sorry, I have a question specifically about Chicago. So as you know, Illinois, their economy is awful. We're on the verge of bankruptcy because of the pension crisis and other things. Do you think Chicago could handle, like, economically a shift towards being a people city? It's a good question. Um, I think if you look at, Chicago is easily one of the wealthiest cities in the world. In fact, if you look at global power rankings by economy, Chicago is usually ranked seventh in the world in terms of its global economic influence. I mean, and it becomes more so. I, I've been amazed just in the, last few years, how many of the Fortune 500 companies have moved their headquarters right down there. In fact, yesterday as I was giving a talk at UIC and they took me to have a dinner right next to the new fancy McDonald's headquarters there. Uh, so the wealth is there in that city. Now there's some commitments that make it difficult. But yes, I do think they could become a people city given the level of development they have. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the reliance on a certain level of homogeneity in Copenhagen, for instance, uh, and other people, cities like it, which were um, particularly in Western Europe, has anything to do with the recent rise of the of nationalist right in Western Europe and its hostility to heterogeneity, to diversity? I think there is some relation because, at least when I was there, and I was there 2013, 14, 15, 16, well, I've been there every year since 2013, yeah, and I've lived there for several of those years. Um, they are used to 1,000 years of homogeneity, and now they don't have it, and they do not know how to handle that. Different ideas, different values, what do we do? And so <coughs> there is, there's, there's conflict, there's fear, and, and for some, there's nationalism. In every one of those countries, you see a rise of a political party specifically to keep immigrants away. Yeah. How do we think, Michael, of outlying areas to these cities? Because you mentioned Copenhagen still has suburbs, but they're yeah. in a different type of model, and Houston's just infamous for this sprawl. So how do you pull a whole region together pulling? Because it's not just the city, right? How do you yeah. get sort of coalitions or metropolitan ideas going? And it varies. So Copenhagen maybe doesn't surprise you. The suburbs are deeply interwoven with the city. and. Uh, in the 1940s, they created what they call the finger plan. So if you think about this, this was the city. And then they said, we're going to build train lines through the suburbs like fingers. And they built five train lines. And all development will be along those train lines. So every stop is a city or a suburb. OK? Kind of like you have here, right? Wheaton has a stop and so on. But they require a certain level. If you went to any suburb in Copenhagen area, you'd be surprised because when you're within a half mile of the train stop, you think you are in the city. The density is required to be the same as in the city, 25,000 people per square mile. 
and you have to get a fair ways away before single family homes are allowed. And that's suburbs as well as the city. Um, so they call it pearls on a string. Every stop is basically a suburban city. That's how they do it. And they use, because Copenhagen actually grows much faster than their suburbs now, because everybody wants what Copenhagen wants, the suburbs are trying to copy what they're doing. Yeah. We'll take one more question after this one. So if you have a burning question, be thinking about it, raise your hand, get my attention. Um, and I don't know what the situation is in Europe as much, but I'm familiar with Portland and Chicago and Houston personally. Uh, gentrification and its relationship to market city versus people city. I mean, Portland has gentrified pretty dramatically in the last 10, 15 years, even yeah. though it leans people. Yeah, so gentrification, because all of these cities we argue in the book, they're tied to a global capitalist uh, system, right? So they face the same sort of pushes and pulls on them. And one of those, and Copenhagen too, is gentrification. The idea of coming in, taking poor areas, you all know what gentrification is, so I won't explain it. It's how you deal with it. So the gentrification happens, very difficult to stop. Different cities are exploring ways to limit it or slow it down. Gentrification can have some benefits because it can bring more tax income and so on. Here's how Copenhagen deals with it as the example. Uh, Vienna is another place that probably does it even better in Copenhagen, which is they allow a certain level of uh, gentrification, but they track how the prices rise in the city, the average prices, and they increase the, they give subsidies to all the citizens for house, housing allowance. So they just increase those. Now they know that there's a limit. At some point, they're not gonna have enough tax dollars. So at that point, they have a plan in place that stops the gentrification. But as long as they can do it, they allow the gentrification, the, the renewal of the city. Um, Vienna, half of everybody lives in government-owned housing. Vienna's solution is they simply have bought the city. It's very interesting. So they so far have bought half the city, and that's where half the people live, and they're working to buy more of it. Different possibilities. Portland, yeah, is there, because they're in that lean market, they're letting more gentrification happen than uh, Copenhagen or Vienna would think is tolerable. A quick question. Has your research looked at mapping on uh, evangelical ideas about um, the value of human beings in relation to being made in the image of God versus some of these other cities and how that... Okay, say the, state the first part again. I missed that. Looking Sorry. at how evangelical values um, shape, whether there's consistency to evangelical claims about the values of people versus how they actually design cities to reflect those values or ah. whether there's inconsistency. Okay, so we haven't looked at it directly. Let me tell you about something we're working on because there's been a series of studies that finds this. Where there's higher crime, where there is more social distrust, where there is more social upheaval, there you find the highest percent of evangelicals. And study after study has found that. And they make what I think is the reverse causal argument. Evangelicalism causes those things. What we're saying, and we think we have data to show, is evangelicalism thrives and, and is attracted to where there is trouble. So the question is, um, this makes sense, right? This is theological. Where there is suffering, there we will go. Where there is suffering, people are receptive to hearing God, hearing the message. The question then is, what happens after that? And what happens after that so far is nothing in terms of any kind of change. Like, does then crime reduce after a while? No. So it, I don't know the next step. We're trying to figure that out. Like, how could you start making those changes? Let me, I think I have it on here. If I, let me see. Yes. So there are different blueprints for how you do change. I just wanted to show you one. Because in social movement literature, when social movements are successful, they're trying to study, like, what were the steps? What are the commonalities that seem to be why they succeeded in the end? So this is one of them that's out there. So I'm going to just put it in a little bit of the context of what we're talking about. So if you were, like, trying to change from one city to another, you would identify the problem and its solution and the, the say that the problem here is that we have the wrong city type and the solution is that we have the other city type, whatever that would be. And then you have to demonstrate why the city type we have doesn't work. You have to convince people it doesn't work and this alternative is the better way. 
Right? So you have to question the assumptions and you have to show that the outcomes are terrible. Then you have to prepare nonviolent grassroots. Yes, there's violence. Let's think about Black Lives Matter. Very, very successful for a while, but it can't sustain itself because it's built on creating upheaval at the moment. The ones that sustain themselves over long term have always been, according to this research, nonviolent. That's Martin Luther King's perspective and Gandhi and so on. Ultimately, if you engage in the violent aspect, you get the pushback and you get defeated. So nonviolent, then you educate the public by framing it. Here's how Portland frames that we're a people city. You'll see these things sometimes in downtown, just emphasizing people, there it is. So you can, uh, you can actually tangibly symbolize it. And then these last four steps that you have to figure out who will oppose you. You would, depending on what kind of city you wanna be, figure out which organizations would not benefit by this so that they will try to resist. Build for the long haul by dedicating to long-term goals. This won't happen in one year or two years. We're gonna do this for 30 years and we're not giving up. When you have successes, recognize it. I was talking to a professor at UIC yesterday and he brought something to my mind that I hadn't thought of before that in his, if you've been following the Amazon thing, uh, Amazon with their 25,000 jobs to two places, one was New York. And if you'll see, they just said, they just gave up and they're gonna take their 25,000 jobs from New York and go somewhere else. Because the locals resisted. They didn't want the jobs, it's kind of weird. But they were basically coming from a people city frame that this would not be good, this would cause extensive gentrification, this is only a certain kind of job, it would, everybody that's here will not be able to live here anymore. In his mind, he thinks that's, start, that's gonna be a start of a movement in the US, and they're gonna cite that as the success that's gonna be the buttress that this can work. If you can take on the giant of Amazon, it can happen. And then you can't uh, let it be temporary. You have to continue to get victories, and eventually they add up to change. Now, do we have time for another question, or are we done? I think we're done, but I wanna thank okay. you again, Michael, for coming tonight. Please yeah. join me in thanking Michael. Uh, as you can see, Dr. Emerson made good on three of those first items in the blueprint for change. He identified the problem and its solution, city type. He demonstrated institutional failures and assumptions and outcomes, and he educated the public. So hopefully we can also be part of that nonviolent grassroots that goes out there and tries to make a difference in these last four ways. So thank you. Have a good night.